Well, amen. Uh, start cruising with me to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. I do want to highlight one final announcement, and that is three weeks from today, we leave for our high school summer camp. And uh, just as they're frantically getting ready for VBS, we are frantically getting ready for our high school camp. But the good news is today I finalized our final speaker. Uh, so all the guest speakers are in place. It's turning up to be a good lineup this year. And so um, here's the deal. We want every high school student represented here at the bridge to go to camp. And uh, we have plenty of scholarships available. Um, so please do not be shy. Come and see me. Talk to me. We want to get your kids, your grandkids, your next door neighbors up to camp. And we do not want money to be the reason why they do not go. So uh, please see me. It's crunch time for us. We've got three weeks left to get them on the list. So uh, if you know a high school student, have them come talk to me or you come talk to me after service tonight so we can get them there. All right. Ephesians 5. Whew, Lord be with us tonight. We're going to attempt to go through this whole chapter. Please nobody leave. Uh, we are going to do our best to do justice to the text, but also keep up the pace. Um, in the first three chapters, we took a lot of time looking at theology and doctrine. Uh, but then last week, as we moved into uh, the fourth chapter, we arrived at the practical portion of this book. And so f chapters four, five, and six, we see Paul challenge the believers to uh, walk a certain way. And that is a way worthy of our calling, a way worthy of uh, our God and our Savior. And so last week we discovered that we need to put off the old man and instead put on the new man. And tonight we're going to discover the call to imitate Christ. And I'd like to open with this illustration. President uh, Calvin Coolidge invited some people from his hometown to dinner at the White House. Since they did not know how to behave at such occasion, they thought the best policy would be just to do what the president did. And the time came for serving coffee. And it was then the president poured his coffee into a bowl. As soon as the home folk saw it, they did the same. The next step for the president was to pour some milk and add a little sugar into the coffee. The home folks did the same. They, they thought for sure that the next step would be for the president to take the bowl with the coffee and to begin sipping it, but the president didn't do so. He leaned over, placed the bowl on the floor, and called the cat. <laughs> and tonight we're going to see that as believers, we are called to imitate God and not man. And as I said, we're going to attempt to get through this whole chapter. I've divided it into two parts. We'll be going through verses 1 through 21 and then verses 22 through 33. So let's get right into it here. Verse 1, therefore, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for the saints neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting which are not fitting but rather giving of thanks for this you know that no fornicator unclean person no covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of christ and god let no one deceive you with empty words for because of these things the wrath of god comes upon the sons of disobedience Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the fruitful works of darkness, unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are, are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the word, will of the Lord is. In verse 18, and do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, 
but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Let's pray. Father, we come to you, and I ask for your help in teaching your word tonight. I pray, God, that you would ready the hearts and minds of the people here, and that you, God, would speak to them. And we're going to be looking at a lot of verses, Lord, but, but I pray, Jesus, that you would speak directly to the hearts in here tonight. Speak through me now, I ask, in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Well, carrying with a common theme found in Ephesians, we see this calling to walk. And in this first part of the chapter, we discover that believers are to walk in three ways. Verses 1 through 7, we're to be walking after God. And then in verses 8 through 14, we see we're to be walking in the light. And then verses 15 through 21 point how we need to be walking very carefully and cautiously. So look back at verse 1 with me. It says, Be imitators of God, therefore as dearly loved children. Be imitators of God. This means just that, to imitate, to mimic, to be a copycat. It refers to a continuous and ongoing action. And I think, it's, I think it's good that we stop and ask ourselves, hmm, who am I imitating? Am I imitating, am I mimicking the things of God? Or am I imitating and mimicking things of this world? It has been said that children have never been good at listening to their parents. But they have never failed to imitate them. And as imitators of God, believers should demonstrate love. And a Christ-like love is a love that denies self, that takes up the cross daily, and follows him. Believers are to become more and more like their heavenly father. And we need to learn to model our lives after Jesus, imitating him rather than others. And in the book of 3 John, chapter 3, verse 11, it says, Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does, does good is from God, but he who does evil has not seen God. The second half of verse 1 says, Therefore, as dearly loved children. Another translation says, Because you are his dear children. So as we zone in here and see as dearly loved children, why do we imitate God? Well, we imitate God because we're his kids. You know, in life, children bear the family likeness and should seek to uphold the family name. I remember more than once in my life, my dad saying to me, do me proud, son. Don't do anything foolish. Don't make a fool of us out there. What they're really saying is don't make me look like an idiot. And in our spiritual life, we should represent our heavenly father well. And we should seek to walk worthy as his beloved children. And this statement now in verse 1 brings us to a very interesting question, though. How can finite human beings imitate a perfect, infinite God? If we are called to be God imitators, then what does a God imitator look like? Well, the neat thing is Paul answers this question for us throughout the rest of the chapter. In verse 2, he says, walk in love. And then he says, walk in purity, in light, wisdom, and then in submission. So let's move now to verse 2. It says, and a, live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So the next challenge we have is to live a life of love. And this church will require daily action and movement on our behalf. How do we live a life of love? Well, I think we need to start out by knowing a little bit more about this word love. Because this word love, the concept of love, can be very interesting. If you were to go to Google and type in L-O-V-E and click enter, I did this today, there would be 8.1 billion search results. If you go to Yahoo, there would be 5.5 billion 
search results. There's a whole lot of stuff out there on love. If you're more of a Wikipedia person and you type in love, it would say it is an abstract concept, which usually refers to a deep feeling of tenderly care for another person. If you were to go to Webster's Dictionary and look up the word love, it would say holding one's opponent scoreless in tennis. 30, oh, that's a different love, I apologize, all right. It would say strong affection for another arising out of kinship or personal ties. Affection based on admiration, benevolence, or common interests. Warm attachment, enthusiasm, devotion, admiration. But most importantly, what does the Bible say about love? In the Bible, we have different words used for love. There's this word phileo, which suggests the esteem and affection found in a casual friendship. I love you, man. Love you too, bro. Then we have this eros love. This is a passionate love. And then we have agape love. And this is the love that goes against our human inclination because it is a giving, selfless, selfless, expect nothing in return kind of love. It means you give and you love expecting nothing back. And truly, we live a life of love when we choose to love, care, and show compassion for others and expect absolutely nothing back from them. And as the second half of the verse says, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. May we never forget Christ loved us and gave his life for us. There's a story of a soldier uh, that was wounded so badly he had to get an amputation. And the surgeon after the surgery said to him, I'm sorry to tell you that you have lost your arm. Sir, said the lad, I did not lose it. I gave it for my country. There is a tremendous price to pay for freedom. And Jesus paid a tremendous price to purchase our freedom. An offering and a sacrifice always speaks of a cost. And this is what's interesting to me. Often we think we should maybe lay down our lives in a very dramatic way to show our love for others. But God often calls us to lay down our lives little by little. In small coins, as it were, instead of one large payment. But it is still laying down our lives nonetheless. You see, as we slowly give and as we continually love and sacrifice, over time it adds up. And we're loving and we're serving others the way God has intended us to. Moving to verse 3. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for the saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. So Paul steps up and very boldly speaks out against some very specific sin. The first sins are of sexual immorality in verse 3. Secondly, in verse 4, it's sins of conversation. And we have the call now to walk and to live in purity. And note the importance of rejecting these sins. What does Paul say? Let it not even be named among you. The New Living says, such sins have no place among God's people. Let it not be once named, not even mentioned once. And so this means that immorality is to be the furthest thing from the mind of the believer who follows God. And so what are these issues that Paul says are not even to be named or spoken about among us? He gives us three things. One, fornication. A straight-up sexual immorality is any form of sex outside of marriage. And this covers a whole realm of sexual sin. If you're married and cheating on your spouse, if you're having premarital sex with your boyfriend or your girlfriend, 
any sex outside of a marriage relationship, the Bible says, is fornication and is wrong. Next, he says, uncleanness. And this is a broader term expanding to our thoughts, immoral, impure thoughts, dirty thoughts and behavior. It could include some immoral acts, but it could also include maybe things that I would say aren't quite X-rated, but lead to maybe X-rated thoughts and fantasies. I've seen things, suggestive materials that feed the fires of passion. Next, it says covetousness. In general, we think of this as uh, meaning a lust for money. But here, it's referring to sensual desires. And it's speaking of the unquenching desire to satisfy one's sexual appetite outside of the bounds of marriage. And so these are the sins that should not even be named among Christians. And church, I pray that by the power and the grace of God that we would avoid these. That we would desire to walk worthy and follow God and we would say, okay, Lord, I need your strength, I need your help. But by the grace of God, may these not be named among us. Believers should walk in separation from these dark, sinful passions. Well, Paul continues on, and he warns us to avoid filthiness, foolish talk, and coarse jesting. And so what are these? Well, filthy talk, you may figure this one out. It's just obscene speech. It could refer to dirty and suggestive jokes, obscenities. Foolish talk really is an interesting word. It it really represents the conversations of a drunkard. You know what I'm saying. Not really, I don't. Right? It means just empty conversation, but also it's empty conversation that's filled with, with sinful things. It's foolish talk. And then it says coarse talk. Making fun of and being harsh toward another person. Right? It's okay to poke and have fun, but we need to be careful. We need to draw a line because there are times we do it, and even in our sarcasm, we can do things to be deliberately hurtful towards someone. If a believer is to follow and imitate God, we must be pure in our speech and in our conversation. And I love how this verse ends. Look at verse 4. Which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. I love it. It's just thrown in here. These things don't fit. They're not suitable. They don't belong in the life of a believer. Instead of using our words for sin and nonsense, we should cultivate the practice of expressing thanks to God for all the blessings and mercies that he has given to us. And you can see a lot of this echoes what we talked about last week. And I got like the two, cha- two most brutal chapters back to back. But last week we learned, right, let no unwholesome thing proceed out of your mouth except that which will build up and edify the body of Christ. And we see Paul kind of piggyback off this thought again and saying, hey, watch your mouth, watch your language. Those things are not fitting for the believer. He continues on and addresses the seriousness of this behavior. It gets real in verse 5. He says, for this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Church, there's no room for doubt. There is no question on God's attitude toward immorality. Paul says they have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. You see, man will often condone but God condemns. And by that, I mean, men will say, we overlook or we excuse or we say, this is just who I am. But God will ultimately be the judge. And people whose lives are characterized by, by these sins are lost, consumed in their sins. And ultimately, Scripture says they're, they're headed on a path. They're headed on the way of destruction. And then in verse 6, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. And it's interesting that even today there are deceivers walking around among us. And I think in our culture now more than ever, it it is so taught to 
uh, not just young people, but on every movie, every TV show, you see that, that sex is the normal and natural thing, that premarital sex, extramarital sex is totally okay. This one-time fling won't, won't hurt anyone. This is what the world is screaming to us. And, and then many have now adopted this increasingly lenient and tolerant attitude toward sexual immorality. We say, well, as long as they're not hurting me or anyone, then it's okay. And I believe we live in a generation that has been deceived by the lures of sex. And if I can expound on that for a moment, if I could just speak to one issue, the pornography issue facing the entire world today, you may not realize, but this issue has gotten so bad that there are now non-Christian, non-faith-based organizations that have said, whoa, this is a massive problem in society. And then again, there's a non-faith-based, non-religious affiliate organization called Fight the New Drug, which is a huge anti-pornography campaign that's trying to reach young people and say, hey, be careful, because there's all these studies out. We, we know the spiritual aspects and effects of it, but, but now doctors and scientists are saying this affects our brains. And, and pornography can become more addicting even than heroin, and it can reprogram ways we, we think. And how shameful it is that our young people have access to this filth at any time, any moment, on basically every device they have. Church, it's time we wake up and we realize the severity of this issue and also that we're not caught up in it. The world says do whatever you want. The Bible says Christians may it not be named among you. The wrath of God is a deliberate anger that arises from his very nature and holiness. And it is an anger that is righteous, just, and good. And his anger stands against the sins of evil and against the sins of evil men and their injustices. You know, God could never overlook the fornicator who destroys a family or a man who rips off the innocence of a child, or the covetous person who overlooks the needy. He would not be God, and he would not be loving or just if he simply overlooked such persons. You see, ultimately, justice will prevail, whether in this life or the next. And this may seem brutal, but I find comfort in that, knowing that all sin and evil will be dealt with. And knowing what Jesus went through on the cross to take all of that upon himself. And this is why we are told in verse 7, therefore, do not be partakers with them. And so just in case you are not paying attention, we have one more reminder. Stay away. Do not enter. Do not walk down that path. Clearly, we see believers are warned to have no part in such ungodly behavior. Well, let's go to verse 8. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. So verse 8, noticed past tense. For you were once darkness, but now, but now you are light in the Lord. Praise God for the but now that through Jesus Christ we've been changed. That he has poured his light into our darkness. And this is why we are no longer to walk in darkness, but instead we are to be children of light. Verse 9 says, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And so what we see as we walk in the light, there's going to be some spiritual fruit that is produced. As we walk in the light, just like sunlight will illuminate and grow fruit here on earth, well, the same is true spiritually. As we walk in the light, God will produce spiritual fruit. And here it says goodness. This refers to moral excellence, righteousness. This means integrity in our everyday dealings with people. 
and truth. We will be people of honesty and that we will be real. We must put every thought, word, and action to the test. In verse 11, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of those things. Church, when it's dark, turn on the light of the Lord. Just like when you go home tonight and your home's going to be dark, you're going to flip on the light, man. In the same way, when you find yourself walking in darkness, say, oh, Jesus, would you be my light? God, would you illuminate and shine your light into this situation? Because light exposes evil and light exposes the works of darkness. Church, we desperately need Jesus. We need to allow him to turn on the light in our darkness. And man, I love verse 14. Look at it with me. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Awesome. The life of the believer should always, in one way or another, be preaching a sermon. It should always be exposing the surrounding darkness. And we should always be extending this invitation to unbelievers, as it says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you life. What a glorious message this world needs to hear. Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. John 8, verse 12 says, Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I'm the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. Well, Paul, man, he's just on a vicious onslaught of stuff here. So let's look at verse 15. We, we see now the call to walk in wisdom. See then that you walk circumspectly. Not a word we really use today. Not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. This word circumspectly simply means carefully. See then that you walk carefully, not, not going around making foolish, careless decisions, but think through every step that you're taking. If you keep falling in one area of your life, step back and look, okay, what are the steps that lead me there? How can I walk cautiously and carefully so I don't find myself on the same destructive path over and over and over again? In these verses, we are challenged to walk in wisdom. And we see a comparison of wisdom and foolishness. A circumspectly carries the idea of looking around very carefully so as not to stumble. You know, I was thinking of this a few years ago. My wife and I were uh, blessed to go to the island of Kauai, the Garden Isle. And we had a phenomenal time, and I was looking up all these different websites, kind of talking about, like, the hidden beaches and all these cool places to go. And most of them required hikes longer than a big man was willing to take, but we did have the courage to go to this beach called uh, Hideaways Beach. It's supposed to be a great snorkel spot. And so we go, and it's not too bad, but then I remember there's just this massive steep incline. And it's the Garden Isle, which means it rains like not only every day, but like every eight minutes of every day. And so everything's just wet and muddy and slippery. So we're going, and I'm like, okay, this isn't too bad. And then there was this spot going down where the steps and everything were washed away. There was just a rope. And I thought, oh, Lord, Jesus, help me out, because this is not, I am not in a good position to be making this climb. I got like my snorkel gear, my backpack, and I remember going and I'm doing okay, and my wife was behind me, smart move, because she was in front, and I went down. I'd take her and the whole beach with me, right, going into the water. But we're going, and I remember I lost my footing. And I began to kind of, you know, you know that, like, oh, I'm going down. And, and again, I had like my, my flippers and my snorkel stuff. And, and by the grace of God, I'm like, Lord, let this not be the time that I go down. Like Hawaii is cool, but I don't want to die here. And I remember I grabbed the rope. And from that point on, I was extra cautious and careful. I was looking at every little step I was taking. We made our way down and I thought, man, I hope this is worth it. And wouldn't you know, within five minutes, I'm out there like snorkeling with the turtle. It was the neatest thing ever. So the idea here, walking circumspectly, walking carefully so we don't slip. New Living says, be careful how you live. And from here through the next seven verses, Paul begins to contrast 
foolish footsteps and careful conduct. And his first plea is to walk not as fools but as wise. And then in verse 16, he says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And so life is short, and we're to use our time wisely. We're to discover the things that God wants us to do and begin to pursue them. Redeeming the time often has a translation of buying up the opportunities. And so Paul is encouraging us to keep our lives uncluttered so that we can respond when the needs arise. Because kingdom opportunities can get squeezed out of an overly tight schedule, we must be careful not to waste time, energy, money, or talent. He continues, verse 18, and do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, that's a debauchery, overindulgence. But he says, be filled with the Spirit. So let's chat about this for a moment. Scriptures do not condemn the use of wine, but it clearly condemns its abuse. And the use of alcohol becomes abuse under the following circumstances, and it is then forbidden. One, when it leads to excess. Two, when it becomes habit-forming. Three, when it offends the conscience of another believer. And fourth, when it leads to drunkenness. And you've heard myself, you've heard Pastor Chuck comment on our views on alcohol. And and I believe uh, Coach Miller from the SoCal Coyotes has has put it best. And I've heard him say several times now, he's like, name one good thing alcohol has done. It has caused more pain, more heartbreak, destroyed more marriages and young people and taken more lives than we could ever even imagine which is why we need to be careful. Again, as a pastor, I need to be careful that I don't present a legalistic view on this, but I would exercise extreme caution and that you would be careful. And what I tell my high school students is this. I'm like, if you have ever been drunk before the age of 21, A, it was sin to drink alcohol to begin with, and B, you should never pick up an alcoholic beverage ever again. Because if you were drunk before it was even legal, it's going to lead to all sorts of problems in your life. And church, I would expand that to you, that if you've ever been drunk or buzzed or chasing a buzz, you should exercise caution because most likely you will be chasing that or something far greater. Why is this important? Paul tells us. In the case of drunkenness, what happens is there's a loss of self-control. You lose the ability to think clearly and to make what? Wise choices. And I think we could all be unanimous in that most drunk people make foolish choices. It tells us with drunkenness, there's a loss of self control, but with the Spirit, but with the fruit of the Spirit, there's what? There's self control, the exact opposite. Which is why we should be filled with the Spirit and not be drunk. So let's finish this first part of the chapter, verse 19. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. uh, Well, I printed verse 21 twice. Maybe the Lord wants me to read it again. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. We'll read it again. So now we see these traits of a spirit-filled person. A spirit-filled person will not be drunk with wine, but instead they're going to be joyful. They're going to be thankful. And the picture we get is that type of person that's just so happy, they're kind of humming a song as they're walking down the street. Have you ever noticed that? Most likely when we're singing a song, we just have a worship song in our mind and we're going about our day. Like normally life is pretty good. You don't normally see people kind of singing a song and then they're in like this crazy depressed mood. Usually we're singing because... We're happy. And this is the the picture we get here, that as believers, we're to be singing these spiritual songs, that as we're filled with the joy of the Lord, as we're being filled with the Holy Spirit, it's referring to these songs and these melodies that are just kind of made, maybe even made up in our heart. We're making our own worship songs as we're going about our day, just making melody in our heart to the Lord as we're filled and led by the Spirit. Well, this brings us to part two of chapter five. 
And if you thought part one was interesting, well, it's about to get interesting here in the second half. In the following sections of Scripture, which we're not going to get to tonight, but carry into chapter 6, we see Paul address husbands, wives, and then he goes on to address children, fathers, uh, workers, and masters. Uh, But tonight we're just going to focus on the husband and wife, and so bear with me. Let's do this. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Well, we're out of time. Let's pray. No, we'll get, we'll get to these <laughs> verses here. I found a quote today from Martin Luther who described marriage like this. Let the wife make the husband glad to come home, and let him make her sorry to see him leave. Like that. Look back at verse 22 with me. What we are about to see is, as we have order and authority within the church, uh, the same is true in the home. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands. God ordained that the place of leadership be given to the man. And God has called the man to be over his home. And I recognize that verse 22 may be difficult for some, but I pray that you would hear not from me, but from the Lord tonight. Wives, submit to your own husbands. To submit means that you recognize someone has legitimate authority over you. The very definition submit is to line up oneself under. And it's simply an expression of a God-ordained role. And if you have any problems with it, I suggest you take it up with him, not me. I'm just the messenger here, folks. The husband is the God-appointed leader of the home, and he is held accountable for that role. Submission has a sense of voluntary submission and yielding in love. It means you recognize that there is an order of authority. And so let's be very clear. A submission does not mean inferiority, where one is better than the other. No. Submission does not mean silence. Submission means submission. There is a mission for the Christian marriage. And that mission is both obeying and glorifying God. And so we are to submit to that mission of bringing God glory and obeying him. Notice what else it says. Wives, submit to your own husbands. To your own husbands. This defines the scope of a woman's submission. The Bible never commands a general submission of women to men in society or even within the church. And trust me, I've been around this church for a long time, and I've heard all the terrible, bad, completely unfunny, submit woman jokes throughout all my years in ministry. 
But this verse does not give man complete, complete power over women. No, this order is commanded only in the spheres of what? Marriage and the home. Notice what else it says. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. As to the Lord means a wife's submission to her husband is part of her Christian life and obedience. This has nothing to do with the husband's intelligence, giftedness, or capability. It has to do with honoring the Lord Jesus Christ. And some of you ladies are saying, Lord, give me strength right now in this moment. I believe this is a great reminder, and it also means that a woman should take great care in how she chooses her husband. Instead of looking for an attractive man, instead of looking for a wealthy man, instead of looking for a romantic man, a woman should first look for a man she can respect and a man that fears and follows God. If you want to please Jesus, if you want to honor him, then submit to your own husband as to the Lord. I found this today. G. Campbell Morgan recalls the story of the older Christian woman who had never married. And she explained, I never met a man who could master me. Good. I'm, I'm glad one person laughed as much as I did on that. All right. But Paul continues in verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So when God talks about man being the head of the woman, he is not talking about ability or worth. Not talking about value, brilliance, or advantage. God is talking about very simply function and order. And the great pattern for the wife to follow is Christ and the church. Christ is the head of the church. It simply means that Christ has authority over the church. Christ is a great protector and comforter of the church. And the husband is to be the protector and comforter of his wife. Again, Christ is the pattern. As she submits to Christ, so she is to submit to her husband. As she depends upon Christ for help and protection, so she is to depend upon her husband for help and protection. As she depends upon Christ for companionship and comfort, so is she to depend upon her husband for companionship and comfort. Well, let's continue, because men, you are not off the hook. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water of the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Many take this portion of scripture and run, run wild with it. But would you notice this beautiful balance of truth in scripture? and the standard they require of the husbands as well as the wives. Though wives are to submit to their husbands, it never excuses husbands, and it never makes it okay for men to be tyrants and bullies and dictators over their wives. That is not what Scripture teaches. Husbands are not to hold and keep their wives in subjection, but they are told to love their wives as Christ loved the church. And I believe many women have a hard time submitting and giving themselves over to their husbands because men have failed to lead in their homes. And it's been said that no wife would mind being submissive to a, to a husband who loves her as much as Christ loves the church. And that is true. Men, we are called to love our wives. As Jesus demonstrated a special love to the church, as men, we are called to do the same for our wives. We must show them a special, tender kind of love. As Jesus gave himself for the church, we too are to give ourselves. We too are to love our wives and to give, expecting nothing in return. And I love how one of my commentaries put it. It said, worldly headship says, I'm your head, so you take orders from me and must do whatever I want. 
godly headship says, I'm your head, so I must care for you and serve you. Worldly submission says, you must submit to me, so here are the things I want you to do for me. A godly submission says, you must submit to me, so I am accountable before God for you. I must care for you and serve you. And when it comes to marriage, please know it is a team effort. And I don't know where your marriage is at this evening, but as I was studying today, I was praying for God to soften hearts. I was praying for God to remove bitterness. And ultimately, I was praying that God would begin to repair broken marriages. That men would step up and lead. And wives would trust the Lord and trust their men enough to say, okay, I'm putting my faith in you. If you fail me and the family, that's, that's on you, but I'm going to be obedient to God and I'm going to trust you and I'm going to walk in obedience to what God calls me to. My prayer is that you would ask God to restore your marriage this evening. And I have two final things on marriage that may help you. Men usually crave respect. They want to be appreciated, valued, and esteemed. And a woman craves to be loved. She wants to know that she's treasured, that she's pride, and she wants to be told that she's precious. <sighs> well, in closing, we've covered a lot of ground tonight. I don't remember what I said in the first verse, but I did jot down a few simple takeaways for you. Be imitators of God. Walk in love. Keep your life in check. Walk in the light. Be wise and be filled with the Spirit. Wives, submit to your husbands. And men, love your, love your wives and be worthy of their respect and affection. I pray the Lord would help us walk out these truths. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. God, we do ask for your help. We, we do ask, Lord, for the men in this room that are married, that you would help us lead, that you would help us to love our wives as Christ loved the church, not to be demanding, not to be overbearing, not to be loud, to be gentle, to be lowly in heart. And Lord, I pray for the wives, some who maybe have had to suffer through some trying times, Lord, would you give them the faith needed? Would you increase their capacity to trust and to love again? And most of all, Lord, we pray for restoration, that you, God, would bring healing that husbands and wives that are here tonight, Lord, would choose to be filled with your spirit. They would choose to walk in reconciliation and forgiveness. So, Lord, would you remove the bitterness and would you fill them with your love, God? Help us all, Lord, to step out of the darkness and help us, Lord, to walk into your marvelous light. Amen.